You're listening to a Burnt Toast production. The Terrible Business of Salmon and Dusk. Written and read by Mike Bartlett. Book One. How to Disappear Completely. Coming out of the underground, Theo is surprised, as always, by Westminster. The postcard-perfect spread of bridge and clock and the House of Commons. Six months in London, and there is still a thrill, like she has stumbled onto a film set. She realises now how much she has resented Josh for working here, his office across the road from the Commons. He works as an aide to a junior minister, although Theo isn't sure what this involves. Maybe she should have asked. It isn't the sort of job he had ever talked about wanting, although... He had taken two units in politics at university. She isn't even quite sure how he had found the job to apply for it. It was part of the quantum leap from where she was, and he had been, to where London needed him to be. The distance between the myth of London and the reality never seemed more stark than it did on this stretch of the embankment. The history swamped by the present come to gawk. For the most part, it's interference. The rotten garbage whiff of diesel, the clutter and clatter of the crowds. On a good day... Theo can ignore it. She is yet to be a tourist to circle museums and monuments. She needs to feel she knows London better than that, that there is a shared intimacy. Why else would it treat her so badly? This morning, there are police cars parked on the pavement outside Josh's office. Blue and white tape sections off parts of the entrance and foyer. People in white paper suits sip instant coffee from styrofoam cups. Theo's anger drops into horror. She hesitates, but a young police officer waves her through to the front desk. She's no longer sure if she wants to ask for Josh. Part of her wants to leave now and stay forever in the dark. As it is, the woman behind the desk takes great pleasure in being unhelpful. She's a young blonde with a wiry frame, an important-looking suit, and a waiting sneer. She looks at this scruffy waitress like she isn't sure she should acknowledge her. Catering staff, go in the back. I'm not catering staff. I'm here to see my boyfriend. The woman frowns and squints, as if worried Theo might hit her up for spare change. What was the name? Mitchell. Josh Mitchell? Theo makes the effort to play nice. Impatience, that acid at the back of her throat, will get her nowhere. Men and women bundle briefcases and clipboards through the security gates. Every man wears the same musky aftershave, every woman the same crisp perfume. These are important people. To Theo, the message is clear. This is not her world. She feels a pang of envy, of alienation, wondering where the road is from her to there, and wonders why she cares. While the receptionist checks her database, Theo takes in the three policemen in the corner of the room, four, including the man without the neon vest. He has the serious look of a detective, sizing her up with professional disinterest. What's with the policemen? She heard her voice strain to be casual. They haven't told us. Why tell the people who actually run the place? Some kind of break-and-enter thing, I don't know. The receptionist clears her throat and smiles like a killer. He's not showing up on my list. Which department did you say it was? He's an aide. If it helps, I can give you the number. Theo pulls her phone from her duffel coat, remembers, and puts it back. Actually, I can't. I'm sorry. What about height? Hair colour? You said he was an aide? Shoe size! Sensing Theo Frey... The receptionist slows down in the apparent hope she might unravel. Are you sure you're in the right building? I've been here twenty times. I've seen his office. You've seen me. You must have. Sighing, the receptionist pokes stubby fingers at the keypad, curling her headset away. Josh Mitchell, she says three times. I know. That's what I told her. There's nothing on the system. I know. I know. That's what I said. I know. Oh, well. Ta. She unfurls a triumphant smile and waves it at Theo. Sorry. Theo leans in across the counter, her shoulders bunched. Forget nice. The police have brought a new urgency to this scene. If there is a joke, she needs to see it. Listen, I don't know what Josh has said to you, but this is all just a bit pathetic, isn't it? I mean, how old are you? I'm 22, the receptionist trills, determined to miss the point. I'm not some psycho bitch, not some stalker. I'm his bloody girlfriend, OK? All I want to do is talk to him. I can see you're getting emotional, but I can't magic up someone who doesn't work here, can I? Maybe you've got us confused with someone else, maybe. 
The receptionist pauses, letting Theo finish the sentence. Maybe he lied to you. Maybe you never really knew him. I'm going to speak to him, right? I'm not going anywhere until he comes down. Theo expects the woman to call security, but instead she flops down in her chair, rubbing her eyes and laughing to herself, as if this has all been a game at Theo's expense. No, more than that, it's a laugh that makes Theo complicit, as if she has been in on the game and won the first round. Listen to you, the receptionist says, her voice losing every trace of a trill. It's low and serious, the vowels polished and round. You think this is all about you, don't you? I'm sorry? This has nothing to do with you. There's no reason for you to be here. You may as well go home. This sudden shift in conversation slants the floor beneath Theo, and yet she has the inexplicable feeling she's been expecting this, that she is making progress. The curtain is being pulled back, even if the picture it reveals remains out of focus. She remembers a night at the theatre, invited backstage by a university friend. How unsettled she'd been by the actors and their costume, jewellery and grease paint. What had dazzled at a distance now seemed a cheap illusion. Colourful fingernails glint on the desktop. Her blonde hair is cut in an immaculate bob, but that doesn't seem to suit her any better than the outfit. When she smiles, there is a flash of something silver on her tongue. The smile is slow and the eyes watchful, assessing Theo at length and finding nothing to report. Theo knows, then, there's a story here. You know what's happened, don't you? She said. Are you sleeping with him? That's what's important to you. The woman tilts her head at Theo, and he laughed and forgotten. Listen to me. There's no reason for you to be here. It's just coincidence. Nothing to do with you. You belong out there, on the street. Stay in your lane, sweetheart. Now Theo is sure she's being insulted. That's good. It means she hasn't made a mistake. Her confusion isn't her fault. This girl is trying to bamboozle her. But if there's one thing she knows, it's how to argue. She feels the exciting twin stirrings of vim and adrenaline and leans in, her nose bunched. You don't know anything about me. And you still don't get it. I'm never going to have to. I tried to warn you last night at the social. I wasn't at the social last night. Yeah, well, you should have been. Should have been? The Social is a bar on the other side of Soho from the Annex. It's stark and fashionable and serves twiglets in a bowl like their exotic fare. The thing is, Theo and Josh had meant to go there to meet friends of his. She hadn't wanted to go, couldn't afford it, and for once, he didn't argue. That surprised her. These last weeks, he'd been on at her for not making an effort, for being too hard on people, for not fitting in. She'd expected that argument, but he folded at the first objection and they walked in silence to the bus stop. He hadn't said much all evening, now she thought about it, not since he had been weird about the boy in the trilby. None of that explained why this girl had been waiting to warn her. Have you been following me? The receptionist ignores her. This isn't about you. Tell your new friend. What friend? I don't have a friend, Theo says. It sounds more pathetic than she is comfortable with. I mean, I obviously have friends. At that moment, no names come to mind. Last time the girl says again, with diminished patience. Stay in your lane. Her hand goes to her forehead and straightens her hair, which has slipped to sit crooked atop her brow. It takes Theo a moment to realise what has happened. This girl is wearing a wig. Susie? A tall, blonde man hovers by the desk on his way in, a security badge in one hand and a wad of manila folders pressed to his chest. His worried gaze flickers between Theo and the receptionist. Everything okay? The receptionist is on her feet, the suit a better fit, the wig no longer a wig, the voice light and daft. It's such a convincing transformation that Theo finds herself doubting everything that has happened in the past minute. She is sure this girl had cheated, had tricked her somehow, but... But what was real? And what was theatre? Just a bit of confusion, that's all. Thanks so much. As the receptionist giggled, Theo searched her smile for that glimpse of something silver. Saw nothing. The man nodded at the police. What's all this palaver? Charlie. Theo steps forward as if she has been standing in poor light, as if this frowning man can't have seen her. Oh, hello, I'm sorry, it's, um, it's Theo, Josh's girlfriend. They're saying I can't go upstairs. Saying these things embarrasses Theo. She remembers a late night chat on the embankment, sharing a cigarette and flirting with drunken abandon. The back of Charlie's hand brushed hers more than twice. She fantasised about him 
about the life he might bring her on the night bus home. Oh, yes, uh, Jocks. No, Josh. Josh Mitchell. Charlie is biting his lip, making an obvious effort to remember. I'm sorry. He looks at the receptionist. For backup? But she has retreated into her emails with the faintest of smirks. Seriously, you too? What's going on here? The thing is, Charlie doesn't hurry away. He stays, edging closer like any moment he will step out of the dark and recognise her. Josh Mitchell, he says again. And Theo. Theo Jones. She hisses with impatience, but feels her determination with her. This conversation is doing nobody any favours. And where did we meet? Here! We met here! At a bloody Christmas party last bloody December! Even then there had been flirting. She'd only been in London a month. She felt new. She felt attractive. She felt anything was possible. Oh, you worked here. Josh worked here. Works here. He's an aide, like you. I'm sorry. I think you must be thinking of someone else. There's definitely no Josh Mitchell here. Not that I've met. He gives her a final smile, but it isn't a brush off. It's a last chance. Say the right thing. Clear any misunderstanding. He's being kind, Theo realises, and it prickles her skin. I... She begins, but no sentence follows. Instead, she darts forward and snatches Charlie's badge. He tries to stop her, but the files weigh him down, spilling paperwork across the marble floor. Before the security guard sees her coming, she's through the gates and taking off down the corridor at a fierce clip. She is all anger and injustice, but she knows she will be vindicated. The cheating receptionist is evidence. There is a game afoot and she will expose it. Josh's office is on the first floor, a narrow ante-room at the top of the stairs. The guard's voice follows her up, but he's no match for her legs. He's on the radio. Another guard is waiting for her at the top, but she pulls hard right through a door she knows well. She expects to find Josh there, waiting, abashed, apologetic even. Josh isn't in his office. Instead, a crowd of police officers are gathered around his desk. Half a dozen uniforms, a couple of plain clothes, and several forensics. White jumpsuits and paper masks. Everyone turns to see her burst breathless through the door. From here, Theo can see through another open door, into the junior minister's office. A jumble of wrong things occur to her. This second room has been taped off. On the far wall, a safe is open. The blue carpet is stained black with blood. There's nothing to see but a dead fish. Her first thought is to wonder how so much blood could fit into a single fish. Her second is to realise there is no fish, only a foot. An orphaned human foot, pale with a bloody crown. A jumpsuited woman leans over it with a camera. Flash. Flash. Time breaks into moments, each frame detached from the last from the next. Flash. As Theo is standing there blinking, one of the security guards grabs her elbows and shoves them behind her back. He snarls something she doesn't process. Flash. Another voice says, Leave her. The detective from the foyer was in the doorway. He nods and the guard stands back, red-faced and resentful, letting Theo's arms drop free. She's one of ours, the detective says. Two uniformed officers escort Theo into a small white room on the ground floor. There is a photocopier in the corner and three walls of steel shelves. Two plastic chairs and a folding table have been provided for the occasion. For half an hour she sits there, finding scratches on her mobile phone. She still expects the screen to light with a call and an apology. The reflex to call Josh triggers every few minutes, and she remembers again that she can't. Remembers there's nobody else she can call. Finally, the detective comes in and drops into the plastic chair across from her. He might be 30 or 40, a once fierce face haunted by pale, sad eyes, a decade or two of worry on his forehead and melancholy in his cheeks. She can see a handsome bloke in there somewhere, behind the wreckage. My name is Blake, Inspector Jonah Blake. The chair squeaks beneath him. Theo, Theo Jones. Miss Jones, he says. Why don't you start by telling me what you're doing here? My boyfriend works here. He wasn't answering his phone. Your boyfriend, Josh Mitchell. You know him? A new poison in her gut. The foot on the floor. I spoke to reception. You, you believe he was an aide? I wouldn't trust her. And he is an aide. To a junior minister, Stephen Robinson. That's right, Hope sparks. Stephen Robinson is dead. That was him. Oh, God. I only met him twice. He seemed... 
Thea realises she has no opinion, at least none that seems appropriate, and something else occurs to her. You think Josh killed him? An interesting leap. Do you think that? I don't think I ever heard him even complain about work. I well, suppose I didn't really ask. How long had Mr Mitchell been working here? Two months, I think. Three, maybe? That's interesting. Is it? I've asked around. There's no record of a Josh Mitchell ever working here. Nobody admits to knowing him. What's more, there doesn't seem to be an aide of that name working anywhere in Westminster. But he was. I've been here with him. He wasn't lying. I didn't imagine it. Miss Jones. Can you call me Theo? This always feels kind of patronising. Like I'm ten. Tell me again why you came here this morning. I said he, he wasn't answering his phone. He might have been in a meeting. Do you always answer your phone? You're a waitress? Not really. But you're dressed for work. And here you are. His gaze is steady, discomforting Theo. I don't know, she says. Look, the thing is, I think he's disappeared. Disappeared? Don't look at me like that. I don't mean lost. He isn't just wandering around, confused or something. This is different. All his stuff is gone. I mean everything. Even his emails. Theo tries to sound determined, but she only feels embarrassed. She hears herself in that small room and can't stand the sound of her voice. The detective stares patiently while she makes herself awkward. Have you tried contacting Mr Mitchell's family? That had been a brief, awkward conversation which Theo had lost. Josh's mother had always treated her with suspicion. Maybe she sensed Theo's lack of commitment, the laziness with which she let her son cling on. I'm afraid you have the wrong number, Josh's mother had said. When pushed, she insisted she had no son by that name and hung up. It was all Theo could do not to fling her phone against the nearest wall. Well, I tried, yeah. You'll understand, I have to ask about mental illness, the detective said. No, well, he never said anything. I mean, I suppose you can't always tell, can you? Forgive me. Are you on any medication? Theo kicks the table leg. The impact rings up her shin. You think I'm losing it? It's a possibility. You think I don't know that? You're Australian. Does that count against me? You have family here? Theo feels her throat tighten and wonders why. No, nobody, just Josh. Have you been here long? Six months? And you've known Mr Mitchell for, for how long? A couple of years? Three? In that time, did he ever demonstrate any unusual behaviour? I don't think so. Maybe, maybe I should have been paying more attention. You said he disappeared this morning. Did something happen last night? Something out of the ordinary? Theo passes the evening, looking for something rotten. She thinks of the boy in the trilby, the small argument he founded, but can't make him sound worth mentioning. I don't think so. Blake keeps staring waiting for something to interest him. We were just out drinking. We came home, we went to bed. I don't think we even fought, not really. We don't, usually. At least he doesn't. And Mr Mitchell, he didn't seem at all distressed. There is a new tightness in Theo's gut. You think it was him? You think he killed Stephen? Do you? Did he? The detective stares, giving nothing away. Does the term Cassandra's mean anything to you? She had bad news, but nobody believed her? Theo is reading for meaning, that knot tightening again in her throat. What are you saying? Half a smile. Blake wraps a brief tattoo on the tabletop. I'll be frank with you, Miss Jones. Oh, God, Miss is worse. These days it's very hard to be invisible, yet your boyfriend has somehow managed it. No criminal charges, no social security, no Oyster card, no Facebook. What's Facebook? Blake checks his watch. Theo notices he has one on each wrist. One is a weird digital thing with a black face. 2005, he says. The before times. I meant MySpace. He has a MySpace and an Oyster card. Blake says nothing. Something twitches behind his top lip, like he's chewing on a frown. Theo's stomach drops. But why? She worries she might cry there in that plastic seat, in that small room, at that scratch table. Why would he go to all that trouble? Why would he get people to lie for him? To lie to me? Nobody is lying to you. The receptionist was. She told me to leave it alone. Sound advice. Anger spikes in Theo's gut. She's in on this with you. You're all in on it. She can hear how paranoid she sounds. Blake gives her a polite smile as if he hasn't noticed. He walks to the door and rests against it with a flat palm. 
Turning back, he leans in over the table towards Theo. I don't know anything about a receptionist, but I'll say this just once. Forget him. His voice is quiet, his expression loud and serious. I'm sorry? Your boyfriend is gone and he isn't coming back. You should do whatever you can to forget about him. <laughs> Hang on, wait. Are you saying you're not even going to try looking for him? We won't find him and neither will you. Nobody could. You really do think it was him? He's the killer. He's on the run. It doesn't matter. How can that not matter? Not to you. He's gone. Forget about him. By rights, you should have already. By rights? What does that bloody mean? Theo snaps upright in her chair, any tears forgotten. Wait, you really are in on this. What is it, witness protection or something? It's nothing to do with the police. Where he's gone, nobody will find him. You could be sitting beside him on the tube and you wouldn't know. There is a thread of sense here, Theo is sure, but it eludes her. She feels the policeman is choosing to be obtuse, cementing his authority through her bewilderment. She smooths her palms across the bare tabletop as if flattening a cloth. Inspector Blake, she says, calm, careful. What's happened to Josh? There are voices in the corridor outside. Blake stands up and away from the table, backing into the corner of the room. Whatever you do, he says, don't try to find out. He opens the door and stands back, as if waiting for someone to enter. It takes Theo too long to realise he's waiting for her to leave. You really think I could, Theo says, staying in her seat. Leave it, I mean. The decision is yours. Is it, though? He seems so unmoved by her situation that Theo starts to feel unreasonable. She had thought it understood that if something happened to your lover, to the person closest to you, it was beholden on you to help, to find them. She wonders if she could go back to their room, their house, their abandoned life, and just carry on. How many weeks would it be until life began to feel sensible again? She's almost surprised to realise she can't picture it. He didn't want to come she says to the patient policeman. To London, I mean. He just... just followed, because he always followed. But the thing is, he changed. After we got here, it was like he'd had some mental breakdown. He hated it so much, and then he just sort of switched off and got on with it, like... like London broke him. Blake half-closes the door out of modesty. You think that's why he disappeared? A mental breakdown, a, a, a fugue state. Amnesia, perhaps. Yes, yes, she says, almost giddy with gratitude. Josh wouldn't have done this, not ever, not the old Josh. That's not what happened. His frankness is brutal, if not wholly insensitive. You said he changed. When, exactly? I don't know, months ago. He was miserable and then he wasn't, but that's how depression works, isn't it? It hides. Does it matter when? He watches her with ease, almost as if forgetting she can see him, making some silent measurement. Probably not. He opens the door again, waits again for her to stand. This time, she does. I'm not under arrest? Would you like to be? Not really, now you mention it. Then go home, Miss Jones. Lead the life you're meant to lead. Theo frowns at his emphasis. It echoes the receptionist. Stay in your lane, the life you're meant to lead. Great. Want to tell me what that is? But Blake has closed the door behind her. The two police officers from earlier are ready to take her away. Do I need to give a statement? She asks. The young woman blinks. What for, miss? He didn't write anything down. Who's that, miss? Theo turns back towards the room she has just left. The sign on the door says photocopier. Thinking about it, she can't do the geometry that allows room for a table and chairs. There was maybe two feet of carpet between stationary shelves, and yet she can remember the cool plastic of her chair. She turns over the card in her right hand. There is a crest on the top left she had taken for a police insignia, some Latin, Tempus Edax Rerum. No station, no office. A precise, antique typeface reads Jonah Blake, with a mobile number beneath. The policewoman is waiting, a hand outstretched. Nobody, Theo says, and allows herself to be shown from the building. On the way out, she stares across at the receptionist, the 22-year-old in the tailored suit and blonde bob. She has never seen her before. Outside, a light rain falls, and it feels appropriate. 
Theo's black work shoes stretch greasy pavement puddles, and she collides with lost tourists checking screens beneath Union Jack umbrellas. There are still no messages on her phone. There is nowhere to go. She catches up with herself for the first time since waking and wonders what she is doing. She can feel hurt chasing her, but she isn't ready to let it catch up. For now, she holds on to her anger. Blake has made her feel unreasonable and overly emotional. He has made looking for Josh seem a choice rather than an obligation. Theo! This time, she turns at once. Behind her is the boy in the trilby, the same clothes as yesterday, the same black eye. One hand dug in the pocket of his crombie, the other holding out an envelope. Don't go to the police, he grunts. He waits for her to take the envelope, ready to dust the rain from his blue shoulders and be gone. Waste of time, yeah? A black cab waits at the curb beside him, headlights on and engine off. Theo holds her ground. I saw you yesterday. You said you'd help me find him before he'd even disappeared. A passing pedestrian gives her a disapproving look. Don't talk to these people. Not my mistake. You just take this, that's all. You know where he's gone, don't you? Stone me. Just take it. Did he ask you to give this to me? The boy's face pinches with suspicion. Oh, Josh. His brow smooths. Never met him. The envelope is as wide as a paperback and as thin as a pamphlet. Its black matte surface is speckled with rain, the corners dog-eared. Theo takes three steps forward but still can't quite reach for it. Can't hang around all day, can I? They're watching! The boy shoves the envelope in her direction. Theo snatches it with forefinger and thumb, using the least skin possible. She's going to open it there and then, but the boy groans. Walk! Keep walking! He turns and she turns, and they go their separate ways. Five strides, and Theo is a pedestrian again, invisible. She turns over the envelope, finds it unsealed, and slips out the tab with her thumb. Inside are three Polaroids. There he is, Josh, wearing last night's clothes, on a street, outside their house. He looks in a hurry. He looks scared. Theo spins on the damp concrete, looking back down the road. She sees the cab pulling away from the curb and runs towards it. Hey, wait! But the cab is already gone. It doesn't turn off, doesn't find itself an alleyway or side street. It just goes. Between a street lamp and a traffic light, the cab is somewhere else. It doesn't matter. Theo has the photos, and they please her in ways she can't quite understand. Here is evidence, hard evidence. He existed. It's the same rude comfort the receptionist gave her. Theo realises what has worried her most is that she might be the problem. But she isn't mad. The world is wrong, not her. Josh is out there in this city, and Theo knows that she will find him, and yes, she will have her vengeance. Sliding the Polaroids back into the envelope, she realises it isn't empty. A thin sliver of paper has been wedged into a crevice. Retrieving it with tweezered fingers, she sees it is a poor approximation of the business card Blake gave her a few minutes earlier. The printing is rough, dot matrix poor. On one side is an address in Camden, the Albion, a pub, she imagines. On the other, Salmon and Dusk, detectives, thieves, time travellers. For the first time today, Theo laughs. You've been listening to The Terrible Business of Salmon and Dusk. Book One, How to Disappear Completely, written and read by Mike Bartlett. been listening to a Burnt Toast production.